I don't know how it works for you, but in the challenges that I face week by week, I often rely on being able to sing, praise God, Amen. to give me strength to make the right choices, to bless those who curse me, to do good to my enemies, and to show the love of Jesus in every place and in every circumstance. It's a walk, and we have to continue that walk. I want you to start out with me in Genesis 3. Once again, we've been there a couple of times recently. Uh, I think we went there on Mother's Day a few weeks back. Part of the uh, task with which uh, we as men are challenged is, uh, is found in the uh, consequences for Adam's sin. In Genesis 3, verse 17, it says, Then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife. Uh, ladies, that should get your attention there. God was rebuking Adam for this. That's not that the Scripture says that the wife should not be listened to. That's not the point. Be sure to understand contextually what he's saying here. What he's saying is, you had the commandment for me very clearly. There was no doubt I articulated that to you. And you were persuaded to move from that because you listened to the voice of your wife. Uh, it could be because you listen to a preacher that you move off of what the Lord wants you to have and to do. It could be because you listen to somebody on television or Christian radio. You could be moved from what the Lord wants you to do. And you need to be on guard. So because you listen to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I command you to say not to eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you, and in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And here's the part I want you to notice, gentlemen. Both thorns and thistles, it'll grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread to return to the ground because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. Now these thorns and thistles, I believe, are indicative of uh, part of the challenge that is given specifically to men. And what I see in this is this thing of the assignment God has given us in the family to deal with trouble, the thorns and the thistles. God has commissioned us. Oh, and by the way, He never sends us to do something unless He also empowers and equips us to be able to do it. And so dealing with trouble is one of the assignments that we have for many years. As a young pastor and as a young uh, dad, I shirked my responsibility. I said, hey, you know, I worked all week here, you know, I know you've been here taking care of the boys, but, uh, but you know, you're, you deal with the bill collectors, you deal with these things. And uh, when God began to get a hold of my heart and started moving me out of religion into a real genuine relationship with Him, by the way, I'm sure that the job is not complete. Uh, for those of you who look and say, Rick, you still got religion on you. Well, that's probably true. But after 35 years, there's a little less of it here than there was when we started out on this. And so uh, God said, it's time for me to stand up and to take on my responsibilities. So part of the thorns and thistles are dealing with the problems and the challenges of operating a family and of life here. But I want you to go with me to Matthew uh, 13. Uh, your Bible may sort of, if you've been with us the last few years... Your Bible may sort of fall open when you get to this because we spend a lot of time in the parable of the soils. Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. I believe is that if you ever introduce anyone to a relationship with the Lord and you're trying to help them, I would encourage you to start with Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, the parable of the sower, as it's sometimes called. I prefer to refer to it as the parable of the soils because it's about four different kinds of hearts. And so I, I just would... Uh, encourage you to keep that in mind. And here in uh, Matthew 13, we have some other kinds of thorns and thistles that God was referring to. But before we do that, I've, uh, I've asked, uh, requested something to my wife, which in uh, 44, no, 47, 48 years since I first started sharing God's Word as a high school student in Colorado, um, I've never done this before. 
But I've, uh, I've asked her to read a little bit of information that is out of some new research uh, that's been released just this last year. And it's a book called The Boy Crisis. And it's a problem that our society has to grapple with. And of course, some of us have known the principles that God has laid out for us here. And America's choice to abandon those principles, uh, at least in the leadership of America, uh, has created some of these problems that we have. And they're discovering now some very significant places that are missing in the lives, particularly of young men in America today, because of the shift in our society. So Lynn, would you just read a little bit for us here? Depriving a child of his or her dad is depriving a child of part of her or his life. That is, findings published in Pediatrics in 2017 concluded that at nine years of age, children with father loss have significantly shorter telomeres. Telomeres in our cells are what keep our genes from being deleted as our cells divide. As the National Academy of Sciences reports, telomere length in early life predicts lifespan. How much damage to life expectancy is created by dad deprivation? Children with father loss already have, by age nine, telomeres that are 14% shorter. However, when compared to girls, the telomere damage from father loss is 40% greater for boys. Okay. This first segment, biologically, physiologically, they're discovering that the part of the chemical makeup and the physiological makeup in our body is deprived in children who do not have a father present. Now, folks, this is not from uh, uh, you know some Bible college. This is from studies by the American Pediatrics, and and uh, God is continuing to speak truth in the sciences and giving us more and more information that confirm how ingenious His design for humanity has been all these years. Go ahead and read the other segment now, if you would, too. So it affects longevity in boys and girls significantly more in young boys if by age nine they do not have a father or dad present in their lives. Perhaps your son feels that monogamy is monotony and changing partners is more fun than changing diapers. It may help your son to know that being an involved dad creates a, quote, dad brain that replaces his single man desires. He'll experience a decrease in the testosterone previously used in the hunt for sex and recovery after rejection, and an increase in oxytocin emanating from the joys of loving and being loved by an infant who needs him. Here's how this happens. When a man becomes a hands-on dad, he activates his dad brain a nest of neurons that would otherwise remain dormant. This dad brain is very similar, although not identical to, the circuits triggered in expectant moms. A hands-on dad also experiences fundamental hormonal changes. First, he will begin producing more oxytocin, a hormone that stimulates nurturing, trust, and affection, and therefore encourages bonding. He'll also produce more estrogen as well as prolactin, the hormone that in women helps produce breast milk. Finally, just as your son's testosterone level drops off, if he is in a committed relationship, it will drop even more if he becomes an active dad. In a dad's brain, an increase in oxytocin activates a greater facility to connect with his children. It does this by enhancing his brain centers of social recognition, something that is called parent-child synchrony. But while the changes in a dad's brain do resemble those in a mom's, the dad's brain also drives contributions that are different from mom's. For mom, it's baby talk and staring into the baby's eyes. For dad, it's playful touching and behavior physically moving the baby and introducing the baby to new objects. Wow. So this is uh, some research uh, over several decades that's just been published in this last year. 
that once again does, as so much of uh, the cutting edge of science today continues to confirm that God is a genius in the way that he put this planet and even our bodies uh, together. They uh, go on, and this is a very lengthy book, of course, uh, reporting, and if you're interested in it, it's called The Boy Crisis, but there are physiological and chemical changes that happen in children as well as in the parents in relation to the kids. So it's no wonder that in America today, 93% of all those who are incarcerated are men, and of that 93%, over 85% grew up in a household without a father. They were, they were never taught and never learned how to control those natural urges that men have. That God put in us, but those urges have to be tamed, and of course, they can be tamed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But having had a father in your life, even if he didn't do a very good job, it's very significant to your longevity, and especially they go on and they talk about life-threatening illnesses that, uh, that young boys particularly, but it also applies to girls, are more susceptible to life-threatening illnesses later in life if they did not have the, a daddy who was active in their lives. So it's a serious thing that God has presented and given us all of this, and there's a purpose behind all these things that he's doing. And does this prove, uh, you know, one way or another? Well, of course it doesn't. But it's just further confirmation that when God designed this planet and created man as it, the, his crowning achievement, that he knew what he was doing and the way that he designed it to function. And uh, it would serve us well as a nation if we could uh, and would follow after that. So with that, just as some additional information, I want to direct your attention here in Matthew 13 about the thorns and the thistles that God has uh, given as a responsibility for men uh, to deal with. So Jesus speaks the parable. He's sowing the seed. And I'm not going to read all that to you again. We've read it so many times. The birds ate it up. Some on rocky places. And it scorched because it had no root. And verse 7 says, Others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up and choked it out. And then if you'll look over a little bit later, Jesus explains what that is. Um, in verse 22, the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word of God, and it becomes unfruitful. So part of what a man can do, a man who's serving Jesus, is to illustrate for his family and uh, with, with, with your kids grown and grandkids and great grandkids, not to put their heart and soul into the material things and the things of this world, but to realize that there's a greater value to be had in life in establishing a relationship with the Creator of heaven and earth. And you can show that in part by your own deeds and by what you teach. Go uh, by your by your deeds. Go over to Mark. Mark's uh, chapter four is. Uh, telling us some of the same uh, in its Mark's account of the parable of the sower as Jesus talked to the largest crowd that he ever addressed. Oh, and by the way, I'll mention again for those of you who haven't been here when we've looked at this over the last three years. Um, now, as far as we can tell from Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, not one single person understood what Jesus was saying. And uh, if you don't know about that, it would behoove you to go back and read Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8 and see why it was not granted. And it all has to do about the heart because God is in the heart business. God's not impressed with songs and with ceremonies and with rituals. He is looking for hearts that are set on Him. And that's what we find being described here for us. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 7, others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up and choked it and it yielded no crop. And he goes on and he tells us in verse 18, others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who've heard the word. And in my estimation, my opinion, uh, I would say this is the majority of American Christians. Now, if that bothers you, we still got the bucket back here. And I encourage you, before you just dismiss it offhand as absurd or ridiculous, Put it in the pot, set it on the back burner, and watch for confirmation of this in God's Word. Yes. 
But I believe that this third kind of soil is where most American Christians are. Long before God really began to open up the Scriptures to us, I was uh, speaking in a church in Longview, Washington for a whole week, and I preached out of Mark chapter 4. And I told the people in that congregation, I said, uh, I believe that most Christians are the third kind of soil. But I didn't fully understand the implications of what that means. <laughs> oh, but don't worry about it. You come to our church, so everything's fine. You take communion occasionally. I saw you get baptized. I heard you pray the sinner's prayer. And if you're the third kind of soil, it's nothing to be concerned about. Well, apparently it is. And Jesus says that those uh, in this way, um, these are the ones who've heard the word, verse 18, and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and it chokes what the seed of the word of God should be producing in you. You know that if you're receiving Baptist seed, my wife and I grew up there, if you're receiving Baptist seed, you know what it produces in you? A look that looks like a Baptist. If you receive Catholic seed, guess what it produced in you? A look that looks like a Catholic. If you were raised uh, LDS, you know what it produced in you? A look that looks like LDS or Episcopal or Lutheran, or we could go on and on and on, Assemblies of God, name any of them. But you see, if you're getting the seed of the real Jesus, then what that seed is going to produce in you is the real Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and again, I just reiterate, for those of you who haven't been around uh, a whole lot, I believe God's got people in every religious group out there. And by the way, every religious group that I know of has some measure of truth in it. That's part of what keeps people held captive. They, they take what they see and understand is true, and then they assume all the rest is too. That's a real dangerous thing to do. And so this, uh, this thing of, of God's people being everywhere, but the, the problem is that it, we need to get to the place where we're the fourth kind of soil. And we do that, Jesus said, if you remain in my word. If you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. And wait, 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 wait. And what if you ask in my name, I'll do it. You see, the problem with a lot of what you and I have been taught in traditional Christianity is we've been taught the promise, but we haven't been taught what the condition is. He says, if you remain in my word, then you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. And whatever you ask in my name, I'll do for you. And so there are people who want to skip over the part of staying in the Word and taking God's Word regularly into their heart and the seed being sown on the soil and the Holy Spirit asking the, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God to moisten the soil so that that seed can germinate and produce uh, the replication of the source from which it came. And if it came from tradition of men, it's going to make you a traditional Christian of some sort or some flavor. But if it comes from the real Word of God... It's going to make you look like Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, if you believe in me, the proof. And I talk about how all different church groups all say different things that prove whether you believe. Here's what Jesus said proves your belief. If you believe in me, John 14, the works that I do, you're going to do too. <laughs> Yeah, we're not real comfortable with that. I could ask Jody to run, grab the scissors. We could pass them around. We could cut John 14 right out of our Bibles because we're not comfortable with that. But I think Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. And do you think you, by exercising your own physical energy and will and determination, can produce that? <clears throat> not happening. That's why we have to remain in the Word of God. And as it takes root... We have less of us and we yield to the Holy Spirit and He produces His magnificent fruit in our lives. And so you get the idea that some of these thorns and thistles are those things which choke and render the Word of God non-productive. By the way, Jesus went on. He said it chokes it, it becomes unfruitful. Verse 20, you still in Mark 4? These are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil and they hear the Word and look at it. They accept it. And they bear fruit. 30, 60, and 100 fold. And what is that fruit? It's capsule description in, in, in Galatians 5. 
is the most beautiful description. Say with me that fruit, one fruit of the Holy Spirit, nine qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what the Holy Spirit produces. Not by you striving, but by you denying self. That's how you take up your cross every day and follow Jesus, as He said. You deny yourself. And you allow the Holy Spirit to be alive in you. Let's look at one other passage. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews. If you go to the Revelation at the very back and turn left, you might get there more quickly. Skip over the Jude and the little Johns and uh, James and Peter, and you'll find Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. God has compassion on those who are fatherless. And in the scripture, um, there are about eight or nine passages that specifically talk about God caring for the fatherless, but it uses a different word more frequently in the translation into English, and that's orphan. Thirty-six times the scripture tells us about God having compassion on the widows and the orphans. There is a deficiency for those who've been fatherless, and God has great compassion for them. Uh, and those of us who, who did have uh, earthly fathers, we retain many of the benefits in, in spite of the things that they may have messed up in. They did something good by sticking around and being near us. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us this. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. There it is, the seed coming into the heart. And the powers of the age to come. And then to have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify to themselves the Son of God and puts Him to open shame. I keep reading. A lot of times we stop there. For the ground that drinks the rain would all, which often falls upon it brings forth vegetation useful to those whose forsake its till. Receives a blessing from God. You see, here we are again, the writer of Hebrews, uh, talking about the foundational teaching Jesus started with about the parable of the soil and the rain, that rain, that moisture that falls on it is exactly like the rain we've enjoyed this winter and spring, and now we're paying the price for it. <laughs> because when the rain stops, it becomes fuel for a fire. We know that. We understand that. This is illustrative of what happens spiritually to people who start out in a walk with God, and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things are those thorns that come in and choke it out. And it never comes to maturity to bear that fruit. So the ground that drinks the rain, it produces vegetation. For whose sake it is tilled and receives a blessing from God. But, verse 8, if it yields thorns and thistles. The deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. It's worthless and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned. Gentlemen, part of your responsibility in your family, your kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids is to warn them about the thorns and the thistles and encourage them to keep their focus on that which really matters. Now that becomes a real challenge for those of us who, whose kids are going through the American educational system. You know, I've, I've already had one of my grandkids tell me he's an atheist. <laughs> Why? Oh, because my nice teacher at school said that we all, you know, uh, just happened by accident here. And of course, what does all the, the latest research and uh, biological study show? It shows that it's impossible that human life started here in the manner in which Charles Darwin uh, theorized. And so, as we've seen in some of our meetings, we now have intelligent scientists saying that, uh, oh, uh, that life from another planet came and aliens came here and planted life here. Anything except for it to be what the scriptures reveal to us as God reveals himself in telling us that God is the one who made this atmosphere exactly right and 
produced in us this amazing chemistry that causes the body to have health and, and to, to be able to fight off invasions of germs and so forth like that. So if the ground in your heart is yielding thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed. Gentlemen, it's part of your responsibility to encourage and urge your kids for that, which is really significant. One of the big questions that I hear from some who interact with a lot of parents is, uh, do, you, uh, do you want your kids to be rich and happy or to be good people? And you see, the Bible is teaching us how to become godly way beyond the standard of what's good. But unfortunately, many have settled for a little seed in their heart while their hearts are really set on the things that Jesus called the thorns and the thistles that chokes God's word so that it doesn't produce the life of Jesus in you. So gentlemen, it's time to man up. Take responsibility and realize that you have an extra measure of responsibility to deal with the, the foreign forces, the attacks of Satan, they want to destroy you. Every bit as much as God has a plan for blessing and prosperity for you, Satan has a plan of destruction for you. And the key ingredient in that is to remain in His Word and keep listening for His voice and yielding to His Spirit. And you can do it because His eyes are moving to and fro throughout the earth that He may strongly support anyone. God's no respect for a person. Anyone whose heart is completely His. And that could be you. Would you pray? Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for the amazing design you put in our bodies and the design that you put for producing healthy life here among human beings. And Lord, with the arrogance of many in our places of leadership, have uh, cast aside the guidelines you've given us in Scripture. And we're bearing the fruit and dealing with the fruit of casting aside your principles as a nation. The reason that our prisons have multiplied 700% in population from 1973 to even 15 years ago is so much worse than that now. So many of these young men have grown up without the influence of a man to teach them how to resist the temptations, how to turn away from the thorns and thistles and to turn to that which produces real life. And Lord, while we want our children to prosper, you said, what use is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And so, Lord, may we as men, as God-fearing men, take a stand against the thorns and thistles and against the onslaught of the enemy and point our family, our children and grandchildren to Jesus. May we manifest the kind of life that would draw their desire to be like that godly father and grandfather that they know. And Lord, where we fail, thank you for your mercy and forgiveness. Lord, you want to see the fruit of repentance, which means we're going to operate differently. May you grant that for us here this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attention today. I'm so grateful that you would...